unconscious contact. So there's nobody out there watching, there's nobody in this world who knows how to swim, who learned it by somebody else telling them that you can swim, or by watching Mark Spitz go through the water, <laughs> or by uh, observing other people doing it. You may remove some of the doubt, but you will never know how to swim until you get in the water and blub around a few times and then do it. And then you'll have a knowing, and that knowing is something that you'll never lose, just like riding a bicycle or dancing the Macarena or making a, a, a lemon meringue pie or anything that you know how to do. It's because you've made conscious contact. And I'd like to suggest that there's a big difference between knowing about a divine presence, knowing about a sacred awareness, knowing about God, and knowing God. There's a big difference. Just like there's a big difference between knowing about the possibility of being able to heal myself of something that is bothering me, perhaps a disease process. I perhaps may believe that it's possible because I've read other people and I've heard others say it. And I've read the testimony and I've listened to the tapes and I've gone to the seminars. But until you have made conscious contact with it, you'll never know it. And I'd like to suggest there are, there's a wonderful poem. I'd like to share this poem with you. It's uh, written by a wonderful woman. Her name is Valerie Cox, and she lives up in Seattle, and she's written quite a bit of poetry. This particular poem really speaks to me to the difference between what you know and what you believe in. Immerse yourself in, this, in these words. A woman was waiting at an airport one night with several long hours before her flight. She hunted for a book in the airport shop, bought a bag of cookies, and found a place to drop. She was engrossed in her book, but happened to see that the man beside her, as bold as could be, grabbed a cookie or two from the bag between, which she tried to ignore to avoid a scene. She munched cookies and watched the clock as this gutsy cookie thief diminished her stock. She was getting more irritated as the minutes ticked by, thinking, if I wasn't so nice, I'd blacken his eye. With each cookie she took, he took one too. And when only one was left, she wondered what he'd do. And with a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her half as he ate the other. She snatched it from him and thought, oh, brother, this guy has some nerve and he's also rude. Why, he didn't even show any gratitude. She had never known when she had been so galled and sighed with relief when her flight was called. She gathered her belongings and headed to the gate refusing to look back at the thieving ingrate. She boarded the plane and sank in her seat, then sought her book, which was almost complete. As she reached in her baggage, she gasped with surprise. There was her bag of cookies in front of her eyes. I love that. I love that. If mine are here, she moaned with despair, then the others were his, and he tried to share. Too late to apologize, she realized with grief that she was the rude one, the ingrate, the thief, the cookie thief. And all of us in some ways are cookie thieves. I have eight beautiful children, our youngest little girls, eight years old. One of the things that you do when you become enlightened and become a guru, like me, <laughs> that'll be the day, <laughs> is when we place something that is important to know where it is, we practice mindfulness so that we never misplace anything. So obviously, having reached this exalted level of awareness in my home with my eight children, I never misplace anything. So I place my keys right here in a certain spot. But my little girl has this wonderful habit of taking my keys and hiding them on daddy in the morning so that she can watch me flip out <laughs> as I look for the keys. And I'll say, Sage, how many times has Daddy told you, don't hide my keys in the morning? Daddy, you told me not to do it. I don't hide your keys anymore. Come on, where'd you put my keys? The last time they were in your dollhouse, where did you put it? Daddy, you told me not to do it. And then, of course, my 12-year-old daughter, Serena, loves to just assume this stance. <laughs>
she's watching me raise my voice. She'll say, I wonder what all those people would think of Mr. Positive if they could see him right now. Huh? <laughs> Get lots of reminders. <laughs> so I give up. I say, look, when I come back out here, I want those keys here. And I go back and I get my clothes on and I reach in my back pocket and there are my keys. Right where I had left them the night before, in my pocket. And there's a fine line, I think, between being a guru and being a jerk, all right? <laughs> and I probably crossed that line more times than I should be admitting here on television. But this idea of being a cookie thief and creating a knowing, a knowing is something, I did a benefit uh, along with my wife a couple of uh, years ago with a man uh, on Maui uh, whose name is Michael Kanaf, who had been uh, injured uh, in, a, uh, in an accident. He, he's a, a quadriplegic or paraplegic. And at that meeting, when it was over, there was a, a man who lived on another one of the islands who was known as a kahuna, a healer, an ancient healer from Polynesia. And he was introduced to me and he said that was a nice talk and so on. And I said, um, how do you get to be a kahuna? You know, do you, do you take kahuna 101? I mean, uh, what courses do you take? How, what, how does this work out? And he said, no, he said, uh, kahunas are raised to have no doubt. To have no doubt. To have a knowing. And he said, when a, when a knowing confronts a belief in a disease process, the knowing will always triumph. And that knowing is something in which you say, you are healed, and healing takes place. One of the great stories of knowing is again with our little girl Sage, who uh, we were uh, spending the summer uh, in, in our summer home, and we went to visit uh, this uh, dermatologist. And Sage has had this thing called flat warts for the last, uh, well, since she was two and a half years old. From two and a half until seven, which is over four years, she had these flat warts, and not only did she have them around her face, around her uh, mouth and around her nose, but they were getting worse. They were moving up and they were getting up around her eyes and so on. And we noticed that, that they were getting progressively worse, even though all of the places that we had taken her had said, they will go away. She'll outgrow them. But it didn't seem to be that way. And they always said it would be a few months. Well, years had gone by and she still hadn't. So we were over, at my friend's, uh, this dermatologist on, uh, in Kihei, and he, um, I said, uh, Kenny, as long as we're here, would you mind taking a look at, uh, at Sage? And my wife was there, and he took this big white light, and he put it in her face, and he said, uh, you've got flat warts. She hates that term. She never wanted to call them flat warts. She calls them her bumps. All right? She just called them her bumps. So um, he said to her, but the good news is that when you get married, you won't have them. Well, she's seven and a half, going, oh, who is this dork you've got me talking to now? And then he said to her something. He said, you know, we can't burn them off, and there's no medicine that we can give them. But he did say something to the effect that the ability to rid yourself of these things is within yourself. And that if you can call upon that healing capacity in you and begin to talk to these bumps in a way in which you ask them to leave, that you have a much greater chance of getting rid of them faster than anything that I could give you, and we certainly can't burn them off because we might scar your pretty face. And that's basically the message that he gave us. I'm paraphrasing it. So we went back that night to where we were staying, and there was a whole bunch of kids there, as there always are when, uh, when we're staying, and all of their friends were there. And we walked into the bedroom, and it was late at night, and over in the corner, in a, uh, on her air mattress, was Sage. And she had the blankets pulled up over her head, and she had a flashlight underneath the blankets. And I went over and I lifted up the blanket. I said, honey, is, is everything all right? She said, shh, I'm talking to my bumps. <laughs> and I left the room and I came into my wife in the other bedroom. I said, honey, you're not gonna believe this, but Sage is in there talking to her bumps. Isn't that great? <laughs> the next night we did the same thing. That was the second night. The third night, the same thing. Now that was third, on Friday, this happened on Monday, on Friday, as God is my witness, <laughs> on television, <laughs> Every single one of those bumps was gone and has never reappeared since. A knowing. You see, there is a stream of healing that is something that we can plug into. It's very much like electricity. People say, well, in ancient Greece, there was no electricity. There was electricity. We just didn't plug into it. That's all. And there's a stream of healing. 
And when we go into that stream of healing with a knowing, we go to a higher level within our 